Welcome to Living Hope. In today's message, Honoring My Dad, Dr. McLuhan offers a tribute to his father and shares some of the life skills his dad modeled for him. One of the greatest miracles in life is the blessing of fathering children. I'm blessed to be the father of five children and the grandfather to 14 living grandchildren. So happy Father's Day to all the dads who are watching this message. One of the great promises of the Bible is found in Deuteronomy. Honor your father and your mother that the Lord your God has commanded you, and then you will live long, full life in the land that the Lord is going to give you. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. This is a promise said twice in the Old Testament and repeated in the New Testament. Today I want to honor my father. Today I want to pay a tribute to the man uh, who uh, modeled for me skills that have been helpful in my own life. As World War I came to a close in November of 18, shortly after that, on July 29th, 1919, Dad was born to a working-class family. <clears throat> they lived in Portland, Maine. As a family, they suffered the hardship of the Depression, the Great Depression, and my father said to me, I very seldom actually saw my dad or spent time with him. He, he left the home before I got up in the morning and he was, I'd already gone to bed before he came home uh, because he worked hard to provide for his family. Uh, his mother, Helen, was raised in Bermuda as a Roman Catholic by her mother that lived there where she was born Eventually, they immigrated to the U.S. I don't remember meeting Esther, but it's possible that I did. Those memories are a little bit back there now for me. So they came to New England where Helen met her husband, Harold. They were both working at the famous Mount Washington Hotel in New Hampshire. Have anybody been to the Mount Washington Hotel or climbed up that great mountain? We climbed to the top of it. When we were young, Margaret and I climbed all the way to the top of Mount Washington. What a blessing it is to visit that place. When World War II came along, it seemed most likely that Dad was going to be drafted into the Army. So he volunteered for the Navy and came to Norfolk to begin his career. And even in that decision, God was working in his life. He was assigned to the Admiral's flagship, and was blessed to never see combat. Can you imagine? Of course, the admiral's flagship was stuck in coffee grounds up in the port and very seldom left. But because he was on a ship and because it was war, he had wartime pay and all the benefits that came with it. Now, meanwhile, my mother was raised in Radford, Virginia, uh, where her father worked as a tinsmith on the railroad. He'd go anywhere on the railroad, the family go anywhere, because he was connected that way with the railroad. Uh, from a very early age, my mother felt called to share the message of Jesus in Africa. The call of God came to her because missionaries traveled through their town and would share about what God was doing across the seas, and she felt in her heart that's what she should do with her life. To prepare for that, uh, she came to Norfolk to study at a school that no longer exists. It was called Norfolk School of the Bible. Uh, it's down on Spotswoods, or that's where it was located. If you've ever eaten at the Skinny, uh, the skinny Dipper, or what's it called, the Skinny Spoon? Skinny Dips, all right, that ice cream place. That's where that Bible school was, down in Ghent. And there they discovered each other because they met at the original YMCA building. It's now apartments at what was then called the Christian, um, the Norfolk Christian Club, led by John Dunlap out of uh, Tabernacle Church. And there they discovered that each of them felt a call of God on their lives, and so their friendship began. They married just before the war ended because Dad was uh, worked for the detailer, and he knew that he would assign for himself where he should go. So it was safe for them to marry from the standpoint that he would not be going overseas. And mother went on to Philadelphia School of the Bible, began her studies, and then in the next year, dad joined them. So after graduating, they spent some time raising money and funds to go overseas. Dad attended the second Urbana 
conference on world missions. This is a very famous conference that meets between Christmas and New Year. Uh, every year since then, that was back in the 40s, encouraging people to open their hearts to the call of God on their lives and to travel overseas. So they applied to a mission society uh, that prepared them to move to Africa and stay there for as long as God would keep them there. So late in July 1949, they sailed out of New York on a steamboat, uh, headed to Cape Town, to the very tip of Africa. Mother says she was sick every day, <laughs> or seasick every single day of the journey. They finally got off of the ship in Cape Town and took a thousand mile train ride, steam engine train ride, from uh, Cape Town to Durban, and that is where their work began. Sharing the message of Jesus, not with Africans, but with Indians, that is what the mission particularly requested. We have a need for work amongst Indian people. Would you be willing to go and to do that? One year after they landed, Dad built his first church. He wasn't super mechanical uh, like his son. I, I don't know where I got that from, but he was a builder. And uh, so he, uh, the, he met a man from Norwegian, a Norwegian man who said, listen, if you get the material, I'll sh teach you how to build. And one year later, they dedicated the first church. My sister uh, decided that she would be born the day before the dedication. <laughs> so mom couldn't attend the dedication, but they went on. And it's a, we always remember when Shiloh dedication is because it's exactly how old my sister is. <laughs> uh, I came along in 1953, and mom and dad remained in Africa for the next 30 years, of course, with trips occasionally to the U.S. to meet with relatives. Uh, but there they shared the gospel of Jesus faithfully to everyone who would listen to the message that they preached. Now, I've had the privilege of preaching in every one of dad's churches over the years to go back. They're still there and going forward in the Holy Spirit. On my return visits to South Africa, I learned plenty of things about my dad that I didn't know. I didn't know how involved he was in uh, fighting for rights for people, especially for Indians. There was no high school in our town uh, for Indians, upper school, and so he made sure that there was an upper school and he went to supervise the tests so that they could uh, graduate and then move on to successful careers. Uh, so uh, allow me to share just a few skills that my father instilled in me, some things that I noticed from him as I was coming along, things he modeled for my sister and for me to follow. Dad was an overcomer, shared the story with you on a number of occasions, would share it again. From an early age, Dad stuttered. In those days, he couldn't say a full sentence without stumbling over his words. And he studied through high school. He studied all through Bible school. And many wondered how he could possibly become a pastor or a missionary or a preacher because of his speech impediment. And by the grace of God, his tongue was freed to speak more clearly after he actually arrived in Africa, in Cape Town. He began to discover that his speech was coming more freely. I was aware he had an impediment, but I never knew him the way my mother did the faith that she had in the anointing upon him. And so it's a powerful lesson that father honors obedience. And sometimes you say, I can't do this and that. Well, you can't today because you're not where God wants you to be. And when we move to where God wants us to be, that's when he begins to release things in our lives. And whatever God has called you to do, he will equip you to do it when the time comes. You know, I'm a testimony to that myself. Dad modeled how to overcome the challenges of life and whatever challenges you are facing in any area of your life. We just encourage you to believe that God will help you overcome whatever he has called you to do. He will empower you to do no matter how difficult the obstacles appear to be. Now, you remember there was a young man that was brought to Jesus. Mark tells us about him in Mark chapter 7. They brought a man to Jesus who was deaf and who had a speech impediment, and he begged him to lay his hands, or they begged him to lay his hands on this man. Jesus laid his hands on him, and he was healed. His ears were opened, and immediately he spoke normally. 
Now, if you know anything about people who have lost their ability to speak and hearing, they need a lot of speech therapy to get there because they just can't hear it and get the sounds to come out. Right? This man talked like he'd never been deaf and he had never been mute. What an amazing story this is. And like my father, I've had my own learning disabilities that I wish that God would have healed a lot longer ago, but in his time, he healed me when he was ready for me to be healed. I, too, have experienced God's touch on my life. If you have a learning disability of any kind, you're here today, and you have something that you're just struggling with constantly, if there's a particular subject, you have a grandchild struggling with reading or granddaughter or somebody who has a math issue or something, a dyslexic or ADD or any of those things, we want to ask Jesus to release his healing power. We just say, Jesus, heal right now. You're watching online. We just release. Uh, you have a son who can't speak. I say, open your mouth. Speak now in the name of Jesus. Touch your son's ears. Hear now in Jesus' name. Do for those who are watching today, Jesus, what you did for that precious young man who was brought to you. So stammering, stop. Brain function the way God intended for your brain to function. You just feel, felt the power of God coming on you, especially watching online. Would you write to me and tell me what God has done for you? So dad was an overcomer, and we'll say that dad was a man of faith. Uh, we read in Hebrews, without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, he is the rewarder of seekers. Jesus constantly said, ask, come, request, knock, keep asking. And we invite you today to ask again for what it is. Ask in faith for what it is that you need. I'll just say about Dad, he had great faith for the financial needs of his ministry and for his family. Uh, Dad raised money for eight buildings. We've done a lot of repair to this, but he actually built the buildings from scratch. He built two campgrounds. I, I remember playing in those campgrounds as a little boy. I remember laying bricks at the second one. He never bought a used car. Can you imagine? I've only bought one new car. Dad never bought a used car. Uh, he never had any credit. He, he paid cash for everything he did. Uh, and you may say, well, he must have been wealthy. Well, in the 50s, he was paid $100 a month for 10 years. Uh, but God just raised it all. I don't know what $100 was worth in those days, but I'm sure it's less than you think. Uh, they double tithe their income. This was something that they told us all the time. They didn't just give 15%. They gave 30% of their income uh, to the Lord. What an amazing story. Uh, some of our network pastors write to me and they say, uh, how do you raise money? How do, you, how, how do I teach? How, how do we do that? And it just begins with modeling tithing like my dad modeled tithing for me. And so we tithe. Uh, Dad modeled it for the people, for the Indians themselves in Africa to, to tithe and to raise the resources that are necessary. So if you're struggling in any way financially, you don't have to do a double tithe like Dad did, but just try giving 10% uh, of your income to the Lord. It's just an amazing thing that you will find that God will do for you. So Dad shared stories of how provision was made for them. And we remember early in our marriage where we didn't have what we needed and God came through on time to provide for us. He will come through for you. So mom and dad were not always treated fairly, but God provided for them. Uh, the, work, the group they worked for didn't always treat them well. And sometimes you find yourself working for people who don't treat you well, but God will treat you well. God will help you in whatever circumstance that you are in, God will provide for you. So Paul wrote about this, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. We hear this so often in the scripture. I just want to bring it to you from the perspective of a missionary. My God will supply your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. This is not the church writing to the missionary. This is the missionary writing to the church. My God, my missionary God will supply your needs. And I want to say to you, my God will supply your needs, not out of, but according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So we can say dad was an overcomer. 
that dad was a man of faith and dad was a man of prayer. Now, I remember mom and dad praying for me in bed uh, as we lived in this apartment in Peter Maritzburg. I could hear a little more. I didn't know what they were saying, but I could hear they were talking. And because I knew what I was up to, I was sure I was part of the subject of their prayers. (laughs) So we encourage you to pray for your children and to pray for your grandchildren. I know that I am who I am today because my parents prayed for me, especially during those five years where I stopped being a pastor and ran from God, ran at least from my calling until in the grace of God, You invited me to be your pastor here 38 and a half years ago. What a blessing. I know that even now in heaven, mom and dad are praying for me. This is what Paul said. I want men to pray, lifting up holy hands to God, free from anger and controversy. Uh, Man, if you knew your dad as a man who lifted up his hands in prayer, uh, what a difference that would make. And dads, we encourage you not to lift your hands in wrath, but to lift your hands in prayer. My father never cursed me. I never heard my father curse. Not ever, not one time I ever heard him curse. He never said I was stupid. Never said I was a failure. Uh, He never said, you're ashamed to me. Uh, He was a loving father. Loving fathers don't speak that way. Loving fathers pray for their children. And If you've suffered the pain of having a father curse you or say that you're ashamed to the family, we just lift that curse off of you. You're in the room, I just lift it off of you. Somebody has uh, cursed you in any way. You're a daughter who's been cursed. We've met so many women who have been cursed because they weren't a son. We've met women who were the third, fourth, or fifth child. All the others were boys, and then the fifth child was a girl. And they were still cursed. We want another son. And so we just lift that curse off of you, especially in the Islamic world. God sees you. God loves you. God cares for you. So dad was an overcomer. Dad was a man of faith. Dad was a man of prayer. And we just lift our hands to pray over every person that's listening to this message today that you'll feel the blessing of God uh, coming upon you and breaking curses that have been said over you. We can say that dad was a lifelong learner. Dad was always reading books. Uh, books were, are always still hard for me. I, I read as I, as I need to and have to. Uh, But it didn't come naturally for me. This has been the great area of healing. I remember Dad reading books like this. A friend of his got a doctor's degree, and and he brought that book in, and I said to myself, there's no way in the world I'd get through the first few pages of that, and Dad just read the whole thing like it was nothing. Uh, He modeled for me uh, reading. It took me a while to enter into that. It took a healing from God. But Paul said to Timothy, work hard so you can present yourself to God receive his approval, be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly explains the word of truth. You're hearing words of truth today being explained to you from the word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. And so shortly after I became your pastor, dad began inviting me uh, to pastor's conferences in places that he was going. Uh, that fueled his spirit and wanted me to be a part. Just a couple I want to mention to you. Uh, there's a British preacher, a uh, very uh, short man in stature, great man in the kingdom of God. His name is Stephen Alford. I don't know if you've ever heard Stephen Alford speak. I encourage you to listen to him. And as he was talking to pastors, he simply said this, if you broaden, deepen your message, you'll broaden your ministry. A lot of pastors want a a big ministry and go here and all over the world and stuff like that. And I just tell pastors all the time, just go deeper. As you put your roots down into the word of God, go deep in the word and let God take care of how broad he wants to take you. I could never have imagined the breadth of ministry that we have right now being heard in 185 countries. This year we'll cross 100 million devices, people listening, but people write all the time saying, The depth of the word is what is helping me. Thank you for the message that you sent. Uh, Billy Graham, uh, somebody endowed the Billy Graham Association uh, many years ago in the 50s with a school for pastors. And we want pastors to learn about evangelism. And so there's this Billy Graham School of Evangelism. 
uh, and school for pastors covers evangelism, many other topics. Dad and I uh, took the school of, of evangelism or the pastors conference uh, shortly after I came here. We went to Asheville. Normally it's connected with the crusade. So you go to the school in the day and the crusade at night. That's how these conferences work. Uh, and so I was so enriched. Pastor Margaret and I have worked with several Billy Graham crusades. The organization has been so good to us and so helpful. Uh, this contact with Dr. Graham was, a, uh, was through a friend of dad who, who arranged for me to go to Cape Town in 2010. You know, I hadn't been to Cape Town or to South Africa since 1974. Uh, it was not until 2010 I, I had the privilege of going back and then reestablishing connections that had been lost and to attend the Lausanne Congress on World Evangelization. People from, from, uh, from as many countries as possible, I think there were close to 200 nations, Christians from 200 nations, followers of Jesus, we had 5,000 people who were delegates and another 4,000 who were visitors. Margaret was able to go as a visitor. But to take communion with the physical representation of the body of Christ, uh, what a blessing that was in Cape Town. Experiences like this touch you and change you, help you understand the power of learning. Our dad missed out on cell phones. Uh, you may not think he missed out on much, but I'll tell you what he didn't miss out on was the computer age. And uh, back in those days, remember Trash 80 and Tandy Commodore 64 and all that, and a uh, little monitor and all the pieces all apart, not even in one machine. The first time I saw that, I said, this was made for my father. Because <laughs> he was a yeoman, for those of you who are in the service, he knew shorthand. Uh, and he knew typing, and I said, this machine was made for my dad. I took him some pieces, and he saw that, and his eyes lit up. He began taking computer classes, and I can't remember the first computer that came out. was the 880 or something, something like that. Uh, he got the first computer, uh, the real deal, and uh, he began to type, and, and then Skype came along, right? And here he is, Skyping with all his converts in South Africa, as many as had computers. And now, you know, if we got a phone call from America once or twice a year, it was a big deal. But now you can just talk to people around the world. All this technology was so great. Uh, so they returned to America in 1979 after their 30 years of service in Africa. What a testimony of being that long in a country, lived by faith every single step of the way, God provided for them. And you'd think dad would be ready to retire, but he wasn't. He became the pastor of Asheville Bible Church for another 17 years. Can you imagine if I left you, pastored another church for 17 years? <laughs> That's hard to imagine, isn't it? He was a chaplain at Mission Hospital and at Given Estates where they retired. Now, dad died, I think, in April of 2013. And we, uh, as a pastor, a long time, you see couples who had long marriages, they would pass really quickly one after the other, but mom lived on for another seven years, and she proved to us she was living for more than dad. There was some Jesus in her that uh, put steel to keep going, to keep sharing the message of Jesus. So on December 8th, 2020, uh, mother passed away. She almost made it out the first round of COVID. She didn't die from COVID, but uh, uh, she died from uh, related things. What, what a great lady she was. And they're buried at the VA cemetery in Asheville. And uh, you, you get to put 21 letters of, of your choosing, capitals or non-capitals, periods, not whatever, of your choosing on your gravestone. And 21 letters is exactly this, many believed their witness, exactly 21 letters. And so every time we go by there, we were reminded of the great witness of mom and dad. As I took dad's funeral, uh, man, I, I knew I was going to take dad's funeral. He said so. He said, You're going to take my funeral. We pra I practiced it for 10 years. No joke. I practiced. what dad, I knew what he wanted said. Um, I fought the good fight. <laughs> I finished the race. I've kept the faith. I hope to not take mother's funeral. Just because your son, you just feel emotional. He said, you're going to do for me what you did for dad. <laughs> By the grace of God. Fortunately, she had written most of it. And I just 
Joyce and I just stood up there and read it together, made it come alive, but they fought a good fight. And so you might be saying to yourself, well, Pastor, that's good. You know, you had a great dad, and I'm happy for you, but my dad wasn't like that at all. In fact, I didn't even know my dad. Now, lots of people like that met. Uh, maybe you're watching. You don't even know who your dad is. It's possible that he wasn't in your life at all. I just want to say to you, he's not like God. He didn't model for you who God is. My dad modeled for me to the best of his ability what God the Father is like. But God will still take up for you. Psalm 27, verse 10, Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Today the Lord is ready to receive you. You never had a loving heavenly father. He wants to be a loving heavenly father to you today. On behalf of your father, I just apologize for not being in your life. I assure you that he was blinded to the, by the enemy to not see you and to know you, the amazing person that you are. Your dad was blinded. And if he had known and if he had seen what God saw in you, he'd have been in your life. Uh, every possible opportunity, God sees you. God sees more in you than you've ever seen in yourself. And he wants to have a fatherly relationship with you. Now, you may have been told you can't have a relationship with God. Many religions teach that God is distant and far away. Here's what the Bible says. I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. This verse is for you, for everyone in the room, for everyone who's watching online. You can see the verse that's printed right there. Believe it. I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. God wants to be a father to you. He wants to have a relationship with you. That is why he created you. I would just ask you to forgive your dad. I don't, just do it by faith. So I don't feel it. Well, just say it. If you release your dad, you'll open up another dad to come into your life. As long as you're mad at your dad, you're limiting God's ability to release to you what he wants to release to you. Just, just forgive your dad. Release him into God's hands. Say, Holy Spirit, I, uh, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you how much compassion the Father has for you. We just break the lie that you can't have a relationship with him. Trust Jesus as your Savior today. Ask him to come into your life to forgive you from all of your sins. Father, I thank you so much for the blessing of sharing this message today. We just pray for people whose relationship with Dad was not like the one they've heard today, that you can start from today and write a brand new end with a loving Heavenly Father. Receive Jesus as your Savior. I pray it in his name. Amen. Father, thank you that you delight in me as your creation and your child. Forgive me for times I have not allowed you to come close to me. Help me to honor my parents as those who gave me life. Thank you that you are my perfect Heavenly Father. Amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.